Joshua Peterson is the production designer on Hulu's Life and Beth. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Joshua, it's such a pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, I wanted to start with a question about what I imagine is so unique about this project because it's both kind of recent period piece. A lot of it is set in flashbacks in the 90s and a contemporary piece. And it's also kind of moving between Manhattan and Long Island and the kind of more rural aspects of Long Island. So I was just wanted to start there and ask, you know, what is it about the scope of this project that felt really challenging and also exciting that made you want to come on board? Yeah, I mean, I read um, the first three scripts to start and um, I was really just struck by like Amy's openness, um, you know, how uh, the, the show gets immediately into some like really emotionally charged um, uh, stories that are really that were, you know, are really personal to me as well. Um, and I, I mean, in the first three episodes, you already do get, you know, a, a broad scope of like where you travel in this world. Um, you have a contemporary setting, but it's, you know, you're immediately taken out of that context to other places. And by the end of the third episode, you're in a, you know, in a vineyard um, that we shot upstate, but um, yeah, Long Island uh, vineyard. And um, yeah, the 90s flashback stuff was obviously you know, uh, design, design wise, I mean, that's like, well, it's a great, you know, way to catch my attention. Um, so yeah, I mean, really initially, uh, our first conversations were really about that. And I thought it was a, uh, a great project with some really good opportunities to, to create an interesting palette and, um, create an arc and a, and a through line that, that you know, I think that we really nailed, um, in terms of starting in, in this sort of like dead, like, you know, she works at a corporate wine store. So it's like, you know, the, the colorways for a logo for that are like Merlot, but it's like corporate Merlot. It's not anything close to reality. It's very digitized. And by the end of the show, you know, I really wanted us to see like wine from the vine being poured into a glass and like actually, you know, um, containing some sustenance, you know, the, the, it's a lot with the, with the food as well, um, you know, and, and re getting back into the sort of like natural palette. Um, and, and really the, the bow tie of that was this 90s world, this flashback world where you see how somebody can, how a character can get to a point in their lives that they're very unhappy and unfulfilled and a sort of return to that. So it's, it's sort of this inverse palette that, that joins there in the middle where you see like the, the, li the, the life and color of, of childhood in the 90s become muted as you know, life events happen that, that affect, uh, affect a person in that way. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, working with Amy Schumer because so much of the, of the show is based on her own personal experience. So what kind of uh, resources and memories and um, pictures or videos did she share with you to help you, you know, kind of understand the tone and the idea behind the show and also, you know, actually get the visual of, you know, the household set and, and some of the other locations that you really needed to get, get right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, right from the beginning, you know, I came uh, back, back to New York to start and on, you know, she had left flowers and a stack of her childhood diaries on my desk, which was a little, which is a little weird. It's kind of a, you know, it's like, oh, I, you know, it's, it's feels invasive to like look through them. But so we looked through a lot of that together and a lot of like childhood photos. I pulled a lot of my um, photos from my childhood as well. And really the, the creation of like the childhood home was a, um, a combination of recreating this specific Long Island, the type of Long Island home and telling a specific socioeconomic story with it that was um, really in line with like the house that I grew up in as well. Um, so we, I mean, I pulled the, you know, carpet from my childhood home and a lot of like really granular details like cabinet hardware and stuff just to really get, um, just to really like build that that house in an, in an accurate way that's like partially a nostalgia trip, but it's not just like, you know, fun 90s. It's a like, you know, it's a house that has a kind of a, a little bit of a sad story and is full of like 
you know, life, but also like trauma and the, you know, the sort of like emotional conditions that, that take place in the show in terms of what, ha you know, what happens when you're a child and, um, you know, the sort of like negative things that can happen too that stay with you over a long period of time. Um, so really like, you know, Amy's openness with that was like a really, um, you know, it was a keystone to like how I, how I designed it. It was very welcoming and, and, um, you know, it's, it's hard to be vulnerable like that. You don't always get that in this industry either, you know, um, to be, to be invited, to be vulnerable in that way was, um, really empowering to the design, I think. And I, and, and, you know, it, ins it inspires, uh, everybody else's work. It inspires the work of the actors and it also inspires the work of my team, um, who also shared a lot of childhood photos and memories uh, in order to create a, a really tangible, tactile world. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you more about uh, the, the set that you're talking about right now, which is uh, Beth's childhood home. Um, you know, we see bits and pieces of Beth's mother throughout the series, uh, but she's largely mysterious to us for a lot of the time. And I feel like we learn a lot about the character through just being in that in that set, either in the past, in the 90s or in the present. So how much were you able to convey just by these design choices that you're talking about, you know, about the character and working with uh, Laura Benanti, if you had the chance to work with her to really kind of um, have an idea of what the character is like and how that should be reflected in in the home itself? Yeah, I, I mean, again, like, you know, my, uh, what I, how I often approach um, the work is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm inspired by what I read and I like to be in an environment where I'm being inspired and, and really returning that as much as possible to, you know, our cast. Um, and I, I uh, you know, I, I think that Laura's performance is amazing. And, um, you know, I, I think, when Amy and I were sort of just talking about her, how her mother designs a space. I mean, that was really important to just kind of have these like, you know, uh, starting points for, a, for how, how a character makes decisions and how that's reflected in their, in their, in their space. And for, you know, telling a story about somebody who's had had money and lived an aspirational life and decorated like a really beautiful, you know, upper, upper class home to like downsize like what you take with you and then try and turn this like very small, like modest home that does not have the like bones that you were initially working with, but still trying. Um, and some of those decisions are like, it's, it's, it's trying, but not really hitting the mark, but you're trying. I mean, it's important to me always uh, when I tell any sort of socioeconomic story, you know, the idea that um, people that don't have money are not expressive is kind of like a criminal offense to me. And um, I think that it's important to, to show that, you know, you try with painting the house in a fun way you just don't buy expensive paint, you know? So there's like lots of little details like that that I, that I think are important in telling those stories. And uh, we used a, lo a lot of those types. Of, I mean, I made a lot of decisions based on that um, to kind of fill up that world. Yeah, and speaking of little details, one of the things I love about the juxtaposition of time in the series is we do see in that house changes, very subtle changes in the furniture, the, paper, the wallpaper, the paint, um, especially when those scenes are kind of uh, right next to each other, where we'll see, you know, the teenage Beth and then, you know, the present day Beth. Um, you know, so what did you want to capture in those changes? I mean, what is it about, you know, what facets of the house did you want to change? And, and what are you trying to convey other than just, you know, we're in vastly different times? Um, you know, what kind of story do you fill in when you're making those choices? Yeah, for Beth's mother in particular, the contemporary, like, contemporary, um, like the contemporary, uh, in the contemporary world, uh, we don't really, we only meet Beth's mother once 
And so the next time that we sort of have an, any introduction to her is the, you know, the contemporary house where she's remodeled over the years um, in a very like, you know, kind of normal way. It's not, nothing about it is super loud. It, it, but it has echoes of what we see in the 90s. Um, so every neutral tone that I, I use does have, you know, this like similar color values as, as what, how we painted it in the 90s, which was like more of a fun, loud, like in your face sort of um, uh, way of expressing that through the color story. And then, you know, knowing that we would be shooting uh, flashback sequences anywhere within that build, um, you know, it was important for me to have like very clear like demarcations between the things and then also certain elements left over. So like the purple hexagon sink that everybody loves in the bathroom, for example, you know, the wallpaper goes away, but that's like a really, cause that's a very loud, like it, it really, like really tells the story like right away, you know exactly where you've moved to um, in time, but like keeping that for the contemporary house is like an, an important detail that, you know, my parents never changed their sink necessarily, but they did paint the walls or get new carpet, you know, uh, over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also want to talk about one of the other major sets that you're working with um, in the show, which is not a set at all, but uh, as you mentioned earlier, the farm in uh, Long Island, that's also a vineyard. I just wanted to start by asking, what was the scouting process for that like? Um, and also, how did you figure out like what nooks and crannies of this vast space you wanted to use for different moments? Because we see more and more of it, you know, as the series progresses. Yeah, so we shot the the vineyard and the farm are actually two different locations that you know we kind of stitched together uh visually um the vineyard you know you know we we went up we went upstate and toured a bunch of vineyards and farms and, and you know just looked around until i found the, the ones that kind of fit together visually that had the same sort of like geology around them and like uh uh you know that's really kind of the the process for that is just finding something where you know you make like a like a like a fake map of like this is where the farm is in relation to the vineyard in our world um and this tree line is the connective tissue here so you know there's a lot a lot of that makes it makes sense visually there's a the the, the visual grammar of it works out in terms of how where they leave and where they enter in different spaces um, but like the tour, for example, that um, Michael Sarah gives to Amy at, when, when she first arrives is, is, you know, that's lots of different locations. Um, another big part of that was finding places that were, that were true to what, uh, true to what the, like scripted um, uh, vineyard would, would be, what they would grow, like how they would grow it, the type of organic farming that it is, the type of, um, like grapes that they're using and like how they cultivate those. And, a, you know, a great resource for me was Amy's husband, Chris, who is obviously very experienced with that. Um, and uh, so, you know, we spent a lot of time walking around those places and, and just discussing like, how, how do we best tell the story visually? And Chris was really, um, you know, inspiring to me in terms of how uh, like how do farmers throw a party you know and so like those scenes it's like it's a lot of hand handmade furniture and handmade like practical lighting and you know everything we really shifted gears moving from like a, a production hub in the city where you know we kind of make tv like tv and then moving upstate where it's like all right i'm gonna put my like indie cap back on and we're gonna make this like a like a little movie um, so we made a lot of that stuff. We, we, we sourced a lot of things locally. I mean, um, worked a lot with the farm to, you know, make sure that we were, uh, harvesting appropriately and harvesting the right things from the right rows of, um, vegetation. I mean, they were really welcoming to us and, um, Chris was a huge help in, in just making that as real as possible. That's so interesting because there are so many scenes. There's a great farmer's market scene. 
there's the party scene on the farm. There's also that beautiful um, final scene uh, or one of the final scenes of the season. Um, I won't uh, give spoilers if you haven't watched it yet, but you know, go to Hulu and, and watch it now. But that beautiful kind of large table outside space. Um, so it's great to hear. And so interesting that it's in various locations. It's not a cohesive place, including, you know, there's a, this multiple scenes on the water and at the dock, which um, I guess is not maybe at, at the same spot either. No, that was hours away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were pretty. We were. We were pretty spread out. You know, as as we often do in production. Um, I mean, another fun thing about working, you know, upstate, which I've I've done, you know, on a, a couple other movies, but um, is working with like local vendors like that. I mean, the farmers market like kept everything that we built out for them. Just turn that into. I mean, it's it was a little farm stand which is this sort of building structure but all of the rest of it that we built out i mean the owner was there and uh at the end of the day he was just like i think i think you've opened my eyes to like what i could do with this space can i keep all this stuff and we're like yeah and uh uh same thing with the pergola at the vineyard i mean they kept that um there i don't i mean i don't know if it's still there i haven't been out there but we'll find out in season two um if, if they kept it or not but yeah that was a fun you know way to build something that allowed us to have like rain and wind cover which you know you can obviously was happening uh, <laughs> in the final cut um but you know it, it was it was what was necessary to just make that scene really impactful and um i think it turned out really really great all that wisteria yeah no it it is um before i let you go just two more questions um one, I mean, there are so many interesting locations and sets across the episodes. Um, you know, there's an MRI tube, the whole episode kind of set in an MRI room. Um, there's Jonathan Groff's character, who's a hoarder and a kind of really imaginative uh, space that I'm sure you had a lot of fun designing. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, of, of everything that you did in the first season, you know, is there one set um, or location that was your favorite to either design and build or, or to shoot at? From an, from an emotional standpoint, the, the childhood home really is that for me. I mean, that was, that was a, I mean, recreating like a child, like childhood memory is like something that you don't always get to do. And, you know, I, I like live for it. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's really healing in a lot of ways. And um, I think that, you know, the, that emotional charge really it, it definitely earmarks that set for me but i also the mri room is just like really special i mean it, it's like it's a really sick set <laughs> and um i think that 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 episode is is great as it's sort of like it, its own um its own like self-contained world wherein you get to piece together all these flashback sequences and I mean uh, uh you know uh the the creating an environment that's like um safe and conducive to the emotional work that Amy you know what she really pulls in that episode I mean it's it's incredible and I think it it's a great way of like showcasing that and containing it within a space that is weirdly sterile and, you know, for obvious reasons, and also like, it, you know, it's the emotional weight that, you know, can be carried in that, it, you know, it was just, it was a special, it was a special set for everyone. And I think that it really has a lot of visual impact as well. Absolutely. The episode is so interesting in that it's so kind of self-contained and isolated in the space, but it opens up I um, mean, the flashbacks, so much of the story that we haven't necessarily been privy to and have been waiting for. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, it opens up that world in a, in, a, in a visual way too. I mean, you really like traveling around all the, all of this all the locations in the 90s as well. It's just, you know, you almost forget where the episode is taking place. And then every once in a while, you're like brought back in by, you know, by Phil's character, which is, I mean, he almost steals the show. Exactly. Uh, and finally, you mentioned a minute ago, uh, Life and Beth has been renewed for a second season. Congratulations. Um, 
do you know anything about what the second season will be? And is there anything you can tease us about, you know, places that Beth will go and new locations or sets? Oh, I wish I could tell you, <laughs> but I, I can't. <laughs> well, we're really it's looking to be even better. Yeah. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Um, Joshua too. Peterson, thanks so much uh, for talking with Gold Derby and congratulations on the first season of Life and Beth. Thank you, David. Thank you.